Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Is it cold enough for you? Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> Well, oh, you mean about, about the message from last week? No, no, I'll pray for you. Ladies, it's time for us to get started. I'm ready. I know we're having more fun just talking to each other. <laughs> I, I was telling somebody the other day they needed to come to our, our Bible study because they get to know people and to really enjoy them in a small setting. And it's nice. Mm -hmm. Now, did everybody enjoy their homework? <laughs> I didn't get it done. I didn't get it done. Well, you had an I tried. excuse. You have an excuse. You haven't been busy or anything, are we? What's wrong no, with I you? No, I don't even know where I live anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't live in Cornelius anymore. But my toothbrush and my makeup are in Cornelius. I have a bed in either place. <laughs> Everything's in the wrong place. Well, they say home is where the heart is, so I guess that means... Pete, you just hang out with him wherever he goes. Y'all can pray for my marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he will get rid of everything, and I'm a, but I may need this someday, person. <laughs> oh, unfortunately, I'm a, a, but honey, you know, we, we've used that at least in the last 10 years. Anyway. <laughs> I have one that keeps nuts and bolts. He has five peanut big peanut containers filled with odd and end nuts, bolts, screws. He says, because we're going to need it someday. That's right. <laughs> um, multiply that. Olin was a general superintendent for construction for 42 years. And every superintendent has a pack up that they put in this big tractor trailer yeah. to go job to job right at the end of a job when they have little things that ah, the cords a little frayed or well I'm not sure why we even got that they either go in the dumpster or in the superintendent's truck <laughs> how many bins does he have Oh, <laughs> for years I saved big plastic, anything that had a screw top on yep. it. And he has jar after jar, and they're by sizes. <coughs> oh, God. Oh, <laughs> you can get washers that are this size out of that jar, and you can get screws that are that size out of those ones. <laughs> yeah, well, and instead of plastic bags that have got everything in it, you would never find anything unless you dumped them all out. Oh, of course. That's why well, my dish strainer left. I said, where's my dish, strain, dish, dish strainer? Oh, he's, oh, I have that in the garage. That's what I dump my screws on. <laughs> well, but there is a good part to having that man in your life. Yes. My dryer died last Thursday. And Olin looked at me and he said, if you can get me these parts, da-da-da-da-da-da-da, we'll fix it. And I did. I got him the parts, and Friday, I have now seen the complete inside of a dryer with nothing but this little tiny motor in the corner. Mm -hmm. But Saturday, I was washing clothes again. <laughs> so it's good to have one of those yeah. in your life. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, today we're talking about something in our um, homework that we all who have lived through COVID as far as we have, should really be able to relate to. So I expect a lot of stories. <laughs> Separation anxiety. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you turn to 1 Kings 17, 2 through 4 in your Bible, we're going to focus on verse 3, and she actually wrote it on page 48 for you. Go away from here and turn eastward 
and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. So, what did he require Elijah to do? To go away and to turn away from people and to hide himself. So, God brought COVID so that we all had to turn away and hide from people. Yeah. Um, in what area of your life have you sensed God asking you to leave or go away from anything or anyone that's been a customary portion of how you operate? Mm -hmm. There ought to be all kinds of stories for this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't take it anything. ISIS when we moved here. Left oh. Pittsburgh okay. and moved down here. Mm -hmm. You know, because my husband said I'm moving to Lake Norman. I hope you join me when I return. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad you did. That's exactly what he said too, guys. So, and uh, I mean, I had my family, my friends. I mean, I only moved one hour from oh. one point to another, and then he's moving me down here where we knew absolutely mm -hmm. no one. We have dark children, our grandchildren. And you moved down here. Oh, that would have been hard. Wherever thou goest, I shall go. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Ours was a move, too. Um, we were down in Florida in Clearwater. Near my parents, our children, um, we've been there. This was our third church. Um, I guess we've been there 13 years and we thought we were going to retire there. We just really wanted to do that. Then Fern started getting these visions. <laughs> he had actually three different ones um, that really convinced him we needed to move back to North Carolina and we ended up at Hunters and Presbyterian Church. But it was a similar to you, you know. Didn't you want to leave? My parents, and you know, they were growing older, and our son was there. And, but you know, when when the Holy Spirit speaks and you got a clear message, you know, you better do it. <laughs> uh, so we're glad we did. And we're we're glad you did. We had a wonderful church. It was a Lutheran church, but. Mm -hmm. It's well, we hope to leave your family you're, church. You're a Lutheran. Yeah. <laughs> well, Catholic, Episcopalian, <laughs> Lutheran, Methodist, <laughs> Presbyterian. Watch out, she may leave us for a Baptist church. Oh, oh no. No, 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 no. I've tried Baptist. No, no. <laughs> Ladies, while we're talking about how the Holy Spirit leads us places, let's go to God in prayer for yeah. now. Um, has anybody got prayer requests this week? Oh boy, we've got some. Gee? I just found out last night that our niece has breast cancer. Oh. What's her okay. name? What? What's her name? Mm -hmm. Rhonda Johnson. Oh. Yes, Miss Ellie? I have a praise the woman that you all prayed for who had brain surgery. Mm -hmm. They removed three tumors successfully. Um, at this point, the only side effect that she had was some vision issues, but they're hoping that returns. But um, they got all three tumors without having a really kind of brain. Yeah. I don't know how they Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your prayers. Yes, ma'am? Um, yes, for Marcy Shea. She's about 36 and has metastatic breast cancer. And so it's going back through, you know, a bunch of treatment and, you know, has two small children. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. I have two requests. Uh, I'm not Italian. It's Gia Luca. He's eight months old. He's having seizures. It's called infantile spasms. 
from trauma at birth from a brain hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. He's taking steroids right now to stop the seizures. And the second one is, they're my neighbors. Their last name, uh, Verona, Rhino, Verona. And hold on a minute. Tom Cox, uh, she and Tom were members of this church. Mm -hmm. And um, one more time, Tom, Tom Cox. Cox. Oh yeah. Well, Tom uh, was taken to what hospital yesterday? They th he had a stroke. Uh, no. His left, um, his speech is uh, he can talk, but it's bad, and he can't lift his left arm up very high. And his face is drooping on the other side. And that's interesting because he was at men's Bible study yesterday morning telling the story that uh, his wife, uh, to quote him, his wife is a bed hog. Oh. <laughs> and he, in essence, was pushed out of bed. And, and when he fell out of bed, he hit his head mm -hmm. on the end table. Oh. Oh, and so I'm memory. wondering, it, it putting pieces generation. together, oh, yeah. that's what he told all the guys yesterday morning. Well, he is in ICU at Atrium, oh, Blythe yeah. Boulevard. They gave, they gave him a clot-busting drug yeah. mm -hmm. yes, last night, wow. and they're going to keep him for a couple days. Now, which hospital? Atrium. Okay. I, uh, 1000 Blythe yeah. Boulevard. Yeah. yeah, that's CMC yeah. downtown. Yeah. Oh, okay. But uh, let's keep Tom. And so I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna text that to Sheila because I don't know because she was out of town. She was having, um, she was having a weekend with her niece, and I think she came back it's today, Tuesday, Sunday night, or okay, or Monday. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She rushed him down. To, she called the ambulance right away. Yes, ma'am. Rita just texted, and she's not here because her Tom has COVID. No. 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 She said it's not uh, that just the cough and cold like something. Oh. He was tired. He got it when bowling with friends. <laughs> oh, my. <clears throat> uh, remember Susan Gibbs, Thursday, major, major back surgery. Yeah. And she was asked for okay. So they're going to use basically everything in her spine. Mm -hmm. Not fun. Yeah. 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 It's, I mean, having had a fusion, I can't imagine having everything done. So. Mm -hmm. Susan Deal. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. I have two. Um, Y'all have heard me praying for um, my other, my grandson's other grandmother. Mm -hmm. She passed away last month. Mm -hmm. she, was, she was over there at the house. And um, they live in Georgia. And um, he spends every other week with his dad on um, that situation. And with, the, with his grandmother. Um, they, they live with her. And um, so every other week, and Kathy, he, her name is Kathy Adams, and the, the Adams family. And uh, she's just been huge in helping that whole situation and being there. And she's an ex educator, so she was helping all during, you know, COVID stuff with schooling. And, and it's, and he, he's just turning 13 this month. And it's mm -hmm. going to be hard. It's going to be hard for him. I wish I could look closer. And then I was running late this morning because my neighbor. One house over, she takes care of her mom full time, and her mom fell, and the fire engines were there, so I ran over to make sure things were okay. But um, my friend, her name is Elise, and she's Jewish, and um, she, they just moved here uh, like a year and a half ago, right in the middle of COVID, and they don't know anybody, and I've tried to make friends with her, and but she's, you know, she's stuck in her house all the time. And, in a real tough situation, and um, so she couldn't lift her mom. She couldn't get her up this morning, and it was too difficult. 
Mary Beth Bardot is anticipated she will die sometime this week. Uh, her husband had reached out to me and wanted me to make arrangements with it, which I, I did with Pastor Griggs. Um, the funeral will be here, and it would mean so much whether you knew her or not. She was an active member of our Bible study, came in a wheelchair for years. She's had MS for since she was, I don't know, 25 years yeah. old. Um, so watch for that announcement, and if at all possible, come. My thought is because her husband thinks we're all very involved with her. I think there's a few of us that, that still are. I thought maybe we could have a group of Bible study up front, because that's the only several people that will have any clues to where she is. She was also a voter, and uh, she was a good voting friend of ours yeah. for years. Yeah, and maybe you could reach out to some of those people. I will. And um, didn't she move to Florida or something? No. South she was, yeah, she did, but she's in South Carolina now. Okay. And, and she, um, yeah. She was supposed to call me, and that means because she hasn't, I think that means that she's now in a coma. He said she's she's slipping away. Is it all from MS? Well, probably. Mm -hmm. Certainly, she was down to about 80 pounds. Mm -hmm. But that's not all. I'm sorry. Um, my friend Carol Fanning died Sunday morning. We prayed for her at church. She was already dead. We hadn't heard yet. Won the golf tournament last summer and dead of COVID complications mm -hmm. in January. Leland Larson, a member of this church, has been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Um, um, we used to sit beside him when we would go to the traditional service. Um, my friend, my best friend in New Jersey who died, her son married a woman and she's dying of ALS. And, um, I got close to her because they came and used her cabin. Um, who am I missing? It's, it's like all over the country. Oh, good friend in Texas, and he will probably die this week. Um, lung complications. <clears throat> and I'm close to his wife. I I just have this map. Death, 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 death. In like six states right now. Oh, crazy. Gracious. Well, it is very obvious that we all need God in our lives. Mm -hmm. Father, Mary Beth said, hmm? Mary Beth Bardot always said, I don't know what people do without God. Mm -hmm. She said it without Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's bow our heads. Father, we come to you with a very long list. And we know that you already know everyone on that list before we even mention it. That you will hold them in the palm of your hand. We want prayers that ask you so much to help and to, to be there for people and to heal them. Father, we know that sometimes your answer is they are good people, they have suffered enough. So, Father, we ask for healing and for mercy and for grace for all the people on our list, for Rhonda and for Aline's friend that had brain surgery, for Marcy Shea, for Gia Luca. Tom Cox, Tom Gibson, Susan Gibb, Kathy Adams and her family, and especially be with the Griggs' grandson as he probably faces the first really close to him person that ever died, with Elise's mom. And hold Mary Beth Bardo's hand, because I know she's reached for yours all her life. Be with Leela Morrison, and Arliss's friend from Texas, and Arliss's friend with ALS. Know that thy will be done, Lord, has to be 
where we stand. But Lord, help those that you can. Help those that baby and people that have so much left to do for you in this world. And Father, be with us as we learn more and as we try our very best to live as you would have us live. Amen. Amen. Well, this was a particularly long uh, set of uh, homework, but I would like for each of us to understand that these questions a lot of the answers we're not going to air out in front of the world. The, some of these are just for us to sit down and really think through. Um, but there's one little piece that I think we can all relate to, and I love this at the top of page 51. Beginning to think of himself as essential. It's easy to feel like we're essential to God's work getting done. We're the only one that can carry on and do it. Have any of you ever felt that way? And how did God kind of steer you in the right direction? Um, we, we find that, especially with people who have taught Sunday school and been part of all the things that happen in a church and one of the movers and shakers and then things like COVID happen and you sit down and you realize that people still find God in this world and you're sitting in your garden praying but you didn't make it happen he did and that is the part of the that section of this lesson that I think we all need to step back. You know, the church, by virtue of it being driven by people, will change slightly as time goes on because different people do things different ways. But God is the essential element in the church and in our lives. Um, one of the biggest parts of what I got out of this was God shields us when and times sometimes when we don't even know he's going to have y'all felt that shielding recently can somebody give me some examples Actually, I've kind of skipped over to like page 57 where he says, I will never uh, desert you or forsake you. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Uh, sustain me as you promised and I will live and do not let me be ashamed of my hope. Um, and it asks you in the margin to write how you're going to change your attitude and that you'll be refreshed. And then we go on to him in on page 59, when you're lonely, God's your friend, etc. And this is where it gets into, I hope everybody filled in the words in the little set of uh, sentences on page 59. What word fit went in every single one of those? God. Very good. <laughs> when he talks about being shielding them, I think when they brought in the hindsight situation, sometimes mm -hmm. you don't know you're being shielded until after something has passed. Mm -hmm. And I think time and time again, um, that happens to us. You know, um, you know, just a little example of you know, getting stopped at a stoplight. 
you know, uh, if you would have gone further there, you may have been involved in that accident that happened, or you weren't at that mall when there was a shooting, or you know, there's just so many di different things. Um, and in the midst of COVID, too, I think some of us um, being kept in, being kept away, being kept away, um, we may have been shielded either from from illness or from situations that we just we just shouldn't be out of. Sometimes I think we don't even know we've been shielded from something, you mm -hmm. know, an accident or an illness or being in the wrong place at the right time. We don't even realize mm -hmm. that God is protecting us from it and shielding us. Yeah, kind of like Elijah was when he was out there in the middle of nowhere and mm -hmm. he was being hunted mm -hmm. um, by Ahab. And Jezebel was out there killing all the prophets and everything going crazy. He didn't even know about it. Yes, ma'am? I want to say something, not because I don't want any kid to do anything. I am very lucky to have a person, but I, I spent a few years in the North. And I can remember being very lonely sometimes that I would go. Anyway, I would go to the chapel. I can remember going to the chapel. I can remember feeling almost elevated when I was in there, the security I felt. Uh, Good morning. I stick my head in the door and say hello. Good morning. I see one person on that. <laughs> I can do anything for you. Come find me. I'm around. <laughs> Thank you. That was a pleasant one. Anyway, I just know that I was protected through all of that. And, and I mean, I, friends, I had a great time. I love you. you know, we had a little mean nun in charge of our dormitory. And I know that because when I went back, to uh, get the records, it was, again, it was also a fine thing. It was the one year records were open to the public, and they ran out all the records for me that it happened. I went because I, I had MS, and I wanted to know, and I had to to write, so I wanted to know what I was passing on to my children. And boom, it was all open to me. And uh, again, I, I, this is positive. It was unbelievable how I, how I could protect you through this stuff. And then when, and then when I went to, they went, they had pictures of my sister's, I was with my sister and my sister and me. And uh, my sister was like, I'm just going to love you. So you pretty want to go up with brown eyes. And I said, I know, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's funny. Um, she said, we're so sorry about your dormitory. Cause I, and I was kind of, I was, first of all, I was young for the orphanage. I was put in foster care, but I, but my sister was so long and I she was in the room and I would be put me in the orphanage because she I was the talking one. So um, anyway, they said they took her away in the search out. They took that out of the She said, We're so sorry for what you girls run through. And I can remember bad things, but the thing I remember the most, I'll tell you the story, this is a terrible story, long road, but don't feel sorry for it. <laughs> I, I went to bed, I was a bedwetter, so this nun used to put me in sit in a chair with a sign on me, I'm a bedwetter, you know, oh. which just sounds horrible, it sounds horrible, but you know what, we stuck together as children, and I never felt bad, maybe I was just dumb, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, what can I say, but and I, I never felt bad because we stuck together, the children did, but I did go back and look at the orphanage, look up, it was an orphanage in Halifax, uh, and it has a website for people who have been orphans, so I wanted to see what that was about. And I wrote in there that I enjoyed it, you know, I felt protected, blah, blah, blah. And then I went on and read everybody else's, and there were so many suicides mm -hmm. and all of them for people who had been through that experience. When you talk about, like I said, I'm either really stupid, and I don't think I am, but, but I was. I can remember when I went through it with my family. Now, this is strange, and I don't understand it. This was the only sad part for me, was we were adopted and then put back in the orphanage. Mm -hmm. I hope I didn't get too much to do with that. But 
Uh, <laughs> anyway, I was with the other family. I was scared. I had an angel. I don't know what I had on the calculation. I'm all crazy. It doesn't happen since. And whoever it was just patted my hand. I said, don't worry. You're going to have a pet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I'm saying you go to the it's just amazing, amazing, certainly in my life. And I had MS, and look at me. I've had MS for 40 years. Not more than And it's blessed, blessed. So God does watch out for us. I think it's the name of God. It's going to get it all together. It's like I did a bit of help out. I'll tell you a quick story about your pastor. Um, when he was young, he went to high school, late high school, and, um, and his mother had some mental illness issues that came and went. And back in the day, you know, nobody knew what to do with it, so she was institutionalized for a while. And his brother was young and sick a lot, and um, his dad was not handling uh, the mother's illness at all, and he was drinking. And so Figaro was kind of in charge, and his older sister was gone. She was away uh, in college. And um, so he, I mean, he would get up at the crack of dawn. He would uh, make breakfast for his dad, and his dad, you know, got off work, no problem, all the time. Uh, take care of his brother, do his paper route, get to school, take care of all that, get home, make the dinner, do whatever. And he did, he went through this for a series of, of some time. Um, she came out of the institution and she ended up having to go back. You know, maybe even shock treatments and things like that back in the day. And um, he had a couple teachers and a Boy Scout leader, and he may speak of this at some point in the sermon, but they were the people that just were there. They were just there, they guided him. At one point, he was following behind the school and he was an excellent student. And one of his teachers knew what was going on, and she just told him, you just, you just sleep. You just put your head down and you just sleep. In my classroom, mm -hmm. and um, one of those things mm -hmm. that was for a season um, that they all got through, and his mom came home eventually, and she would change the personality, but she did well. And um, that was the time when I think he was taken care of and shielded by certain people mm -hmm. in his life. Mm -hmm. It's hard to think of a young man being put in that situation and and having to do so much and work so hard and then you think he's being shielded but he was you know there's things that happen um, Olin and I were in a truck accident um, the first week that we were making masks for COVID from um, the sewing ministry because I had a bag of masks that I was bringing down to Tom. And Olin said, oh, I'll drive you. We'll go together. And we started to get into my car, and I realized I hadn't gotten gas, and I didn't know when. And I wasn't really thinking I wanted to go grab a hold of a gas handle and get germs from the world yet. I didn't know what was going on. You have to understand, I am a medical laboratory scientist. so. Germs are a big deal to me. <laughs> so we got in his big old truck. It's a Ford F-250, you know, this huge, you're like driving in a tank. We were not even a quarter of a mile from our front door when a man driving a big uh, semi-truck with the, the construction dumpster that was full behind it ran a stop sign and creamed us. And my vision of the accident in the lens don't even there. It was like we were in two different things. He was all worried they tore off the back end of the truck. You know, it's so good they hit us there. And I'm like, were you in the same accident I was in? <laughs> It took the, the big mirror, you know, they have those big, huge mirrors, and it slammed it into the side of the truck, and it hit the post that my seatbelt 
was hooked to and jerked it around and separated my shoulder and took the door behind me out and then took off the whole back end of the truck. So we sort of were in the same accident. Um, but he was so good about getting 911 and helping the ambulance people get me out of the truck. Um, and then he and the neighbor who came up, came down in the car and helped him dump out the truck because we realized that we were probably never going to see that truck again. And we did go see it because I was telling Olin how horrified I was when I saw that mirror coming at me and he's like, watching. He didn't hit us in the front of the truck. He tore off the back of the truck and I'm like, yeah, right. And so we went to the um, junkyard place where they had the truck to make sure we had everything out of it. And when he saw the mirror was no longer, I mean, it was hanging down on the ground. And my door was okay, but where the post behind me was and on back just went away. He was like, you could have been killed. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and I had my, my thing for, I've even got pictures of me sewing left-handed with my, my sling on, because I just can't stay out of sewing room. But it was a bad accident. It was really scary and it's time when you didn't want to really go to the hospital so the ambulance comes and gets me and <laughs> you go to the hospital and they put you in this little room and he couldn't even come in so after they did the x-rays and figured out what was going on and stuff he had to wait outside in the car to pick me up but after all of that i am absolutely sure that god was looking out for us because that was a big substantial <clears throat> tremendous truck that took a monster hit and we both walked away basically. I mean a little physical therapy and we were fine. Um, had we been in my little tiny minivan, I'm not sure either one of us would be here today to tell the story. And it was just, you know, God saying, we're not driving that one today. Let's take that big thing over there. So. I think he does things like that sometimes to make us see that he's part of our lives. Yeah. And sometimes I think he shields us. <coughs> we had a neighbor whose little girl was almost harmed by a not so nice person. The guy had her separated out from the other kids and was kind of walking away with her. And two or three of the kids in the neighborhood realized and went and got an adult and nothing happened to this child. The child was five years old. To this day, she has no idea the danger she was in. And we're not all gonna tell her either. Um, there's no need for her to have that trauma to worry about. And I think much like those children protected that little girl I think God had them there to do that, and she'll never know. And I just thank God for all the times I never know that He's there. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Something else that we said in the book that I just to me because I never looked at it that way. The hindsight, and, the blood, and I talked to my daughter who's born to a divorce right now, and I said, "When God said hindsight is 2020." I always thought of that, yeah, I look back and I see what I should have done or what I could have done, and then I was blessed, but, I was, but it's also a lesson, to, and I never thought of that. Mm -hmm. um, to you, I said, what you've gone through now to my daughter, that's a gift to you. That's a lesson. You now know, you've learned so much, you've learned what's important to you, you've learned uh, that you deserve to be treated well, that God wants you to be treated well, and what to look for another relationship. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's, I, I'm sure you all thought that it was thought of this before, but I never did think that the hindsight was the lesson for the future. It was just that you look back and it's easy to see what should have been. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. What, what, what you learned in the orphanage that you probably never would have learned by going to the chapel and mm -hmm. to go out your faith and oh. on God. 
they might be able to have had to do that in another situation. Right, and I also want because I've had a lot of that. I also know that God is my God. When I have a parent or some you know who's cool or whatever, um, that's not really my parent. God is my father. God is always my father. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. One thing to keep in mind too with all of this is that as we talk about different things in our in our services and in our church and a way to touch people and reach people, these individual stories are your testimony. There's a very much you can put history and take his and make that capital. <coughs> That's his story, your history in your life that you need to share with someone because a lot of people just think our son. He just thinks it's coincidence. Um, and a lot of people think that way mm -hmm. nowadays. And, you know, trying to get someone to come to church or be more aware of God in their lives or that kind of thing, you know, it just starts with telling your story and having someone have some sort of connection with you with whatever that story might, might be. Um, and that's the way to start to reach someone. Well, I'm going to ask one. Yeah. Years ago, I heard a missionary speak. I always thought of those nudges you get from the Holy Spirit as things you should do. And he taught a lesson, and his illustration, which was truly so graphic, he was traveling down a hill, and he said, I heard in my head the Holy Spirit say, pull over, pull over. There was no reason to pull over. And he did, and what he didn't realize was there was a right turn, and a truck had lost its freight coming down the hill, and it was on both sides of a narrow bridge, and he would have been killed. And that stuck in my head. And years later, I had Kristen and another little girl in the back of our little sedan, and I'm driving down a road, and I noticed the car ahead of me seems to be weaving a little bit, but I was lingering back uh, with a kid on drugs, and I felt that blast in my head pull over. And it was like, oh, that's what happened with John McClure, the missionary. And I immediately pulled over as if I was going to park. And he veered off, hit a tree, ran up the tree, and he, his car turned over. He would have been on top of my car we would have been crushed. So if you hear those strong, strong indications, sometimes it's to save your life and not to save somebody's soul. I mean, one morning, and um, I got this kind of a little thing to pray for morning, and there was my co-worker. Well, I saw her, it was a Sunday, I saw her on Monday, and I said, I said, well, I just like the strangest, like, pray for morning, so I was kind of right now, and prayed and come to find out that morning your son and his girlfriend were in a car accident. They didn't get hurt, but just before, a few hours before the, the same area, another person did and they got killed. Hmm. But it was just like so bizarre, like why would I be, like why would I pray for Maureen? I mean, I normally don't think of a co but mm -hmm. yeah, she's like, thank you so much, she's saying, you what? Why do you think? Like, why? Mm -hmm. It was just like, it was just, mm -hmm. wow, you yeah. We have to tune into those voices, though, don't we? Yeah, when I hear that, yeah. when I hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Be quiet enough that we actually hear the yeah. telling. <laughs> yeah. Good example. Just one more little thing I want to say, because I had this, I was raised Catholic, and I was a DD professor. I love the chapel, I really did, and I really did feel better than that. However, they also had, just to be honest, they had a beautiful statue of the infant of Prague. In their, in their chapel, and they used to change the vestments on that prom mm -hmm. like every day. And they were beautiful satin vestments. I just used to love, I also love to the clothes in it. But I, mean, I really didn't feel better by going to church, but I love those clothes in the prom. <laughs> 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 well, I really believe we need to 
be grateful for the things we know he did for us and for the things that he did without our ever knowing. Um, it is wonderful to be able to have someone that you can depend on like you can trust. It's just a special, it gives you an inner strength that I don't think other people have. Ladies, let's watch a video. <laughs> As we launch into week three together, more than anything, you know, I really feel compelled to just pray for you. Because this week we're going with Elijah into uncharted territory. It's going to be an unfamiliar place for him. And in many ways, it's going to be uncomfortable. And yet he's going to be willing to go. And I know that if the Lord is allowing you and me to intersect with Elijah's story, to dive in deeply to it, to allow his spirit to teach us through it, then that means he is preparing us for the uncharted territory that he wants to take us into. An unprecedented place for you, for me. Places that maybe our family, you know, our mothers and grandmothers and great grandmothers, they never went. Attitudes that he's going to ask us to leave behind, new ones he's gonna ask us to adopt. New dreams, new visions, uncomfortable, uncharted territories of faith. I wanna pray for you in advance. <laughs> that you'll already have a yes in your spirit, that before you even know where he's gonna ask you to go, the new places and new attitudes and actions he's going to ask you to adopt and incorporate into your life, that you'll already have the courage of the Holy Spirit of God bubbling up on the inside of you, knowing that wherever he calls you, he's going to equip you and he's gonna empower you to sustain you there. So, let me pray. Lord Jesus, I pray for my sister. I pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ that you would gird her up by your spirit, that you would soften and tenderize her heart so that she is sensitive to the whispers of your sweet Holy Spirit and that wherever you ask her to go, wherever you send her, she will say yes unapologetically and without wavering, Father, and that you will give her courage to walk in the fullness of the abundant life to which you have called her. In Jesus' name, amen. David Livingston was a missionary. He lived in the 1800s. And was, one of his excursions was in a very remote uh, part of the world. He was in uncharted territory and he actually needed to send for some folks to help him out just a little bit. So he sent word back so that other people could come and support him in his efforts to evangelize. And after he'd sent word back and was waiting patiently for some folks to come, he got a message back from home base. And the message back from home base said that the territory he was in was so unfamiliar and it was so deep and it was so remote that the people who were considering coming actually were having a hard time committing because it was just uninviting. The people who were considering it were unwilling to come because they needed some roads to be paved so that they would be able to find him more specifically and more easily. Well, when David Livingston got that message, he sent word back that said, if a person needs roads before they'll come, then don't send them. In other words, they are the wrong people for this kind of job. And the reality is that sometimes when we go with God, we're going to have to be brave enough and daring enough to go into uncharted territory. And it's going to feel unfamiliar. That's what faith is. Faith is going to places, doing things, responding in obedience to God when we cannot see what the end result is going to be. When we can't pave out the road, when nobody's paved out the road before us and we're having to travel into unfamiliar, sometimes uncomfortable, sometimes difficult roads, but we're doing so at the beckoning of God's leading in our life. This is, in essence, the spirit of Elijah. 
And as the voice of God to his people, as the representative of God's presence amongst them, he had to be willing to stand alone and then call people upward to his standard instead of sinking down to theirs. He had to be willing to step into territory, and so do we, that we oftentimes don't have an easy road to be able to navigate, only the clear clarion call of God. Elijah would face this every step of the way. I don't know if you've noticed this or not and detected it throughout our study, but all the way from the very beginning until now, he keeps getting thrust into unfamiliar territory. Right at the beginning, he left his home, the comforts of his home in Gilead, heading into an unknown city center where he'd face the sheer risk of his life standing in front of King Ahab and speaking bold truth to power. And then he'd face the great unknown again, heading to the lone brook of Kirith, where little, you know, he had little knowledge there about how he was going to be sustained for 18 long months. And now the details of the next portion of his journey, they are set before him and they carry an equal measure of risk and uncertainty for him and for all the participants involved. This next stage of his journey is found in 1 Kings chapter 17, that's where we're spending most of our time, 17 and 18. I'm going to read 1 Kings chapter 17, beginning in verse 8, and I'm going to read all the way through 16. This is going to give us the broad story of Elijah's time at Zarephath. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I've commanded a widow there to provide for you. So... He arose, he went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there, she was gathering sticks, and he called to her and said, please get me a little water in a jar that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, don't forget that part, she was going to get it. He called out to her and he said, well, please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. And she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in a bowl and a little oil in a jar. And behold, I'm gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare it for me and my son. We're going to eat it and then we're going to die. Then Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as you said and make me a little bread cake from it first and bring it out to me. And afterward, you may make one for yourself and for your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. So she went and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The bowl of flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah. This is one of the most stunning miracles that takes place in all of the Old Testament and certainly one of the most stunning within Elijah's narrative. And I'm looking forward to this week with you because Elijah here is going into uncharted, unfamiliar territory and I'm so glad that he was willing to go down a path that had not been previously paid, paved because he's going into a Gentile region that is going to allow for us to see the power and the goodness of God when we are in positions where we have lack and scarcity and have a deficiency in our own lives. And so stretched out before us in Bible study over this week, we are going to walk with Elijah as he goes goes by faith into this next phase of the journey. There are going to be some significant theological principles that have real broad repercussions for the entire story of redemption that we're going to see these treasures unfolding in this story. We're going to go into an unusual place and see his his interaction with an unusual person. And here in Zarephath, he's going to be refined. He's going to be purified. He's going to be prepared for Mount Carmel. And so are we. And to be clear, this is an unfamiliar place, and this is an unfamiliar, um, uncomfortable person for him to be in an encounter with. That's what faith is. Faith is trusting God to go to an uncomfortable, unfamiliar place and to maybe in interact with people who are unusual for us to interact with so that God can use us to help inaugurate his move in our own lives and in theirs. Just for a little background, let me tell you that Zarephath would have been uncharted territory for Elijah because it was a small small village that was located outside of the bounds of Israel's population, which means it was a Gentile nation. 
and it was situated in a hub of idolatry, he would have had a hard time trying to reconcile in his mind how going outside of the boundaries of Israel was going to help him carry out the plan that he knew he had as God's prophet. He was supposed to be the mouthpiece of God to the nation of Israel, to the people of God, to call them back into allegiance with the one true God. But God is now sending him outside of the boundaries of Israel in this idol worshiping um, part of the, of the community. And he here in Sidon, he was going to have to speak to people who were actually in some ways responsible for some of the trouble that was happening in, happening in regards to idolatry within the nation of Israel. Here's why. The king of Sidon had a daughter and her name was Jezebel. Jezebel, the one who would almost single-handedly foisted idol worship, idol worship completely onto the nation of Israel, who had put hundreds of pagan priests on government salary and helped to legislate idolatry. The one who would later hunt Elijah down with a plan to kill him and completely annihilate his efforts. She was from this region from right around this town of Zarephath. Her father was the king of Sidon, and this is the place that God is sending Elijah to. Yeah, this place would have been unfamiliar, uncharted territory. He wouldn't have understood why he was going there, but not only was the place uncomfortable for him, the person would have been uncomfortable for him. This whole assignment would have bristled against Elijah's sensibility because he was being sent to this unfamiliar place, not only was he not gonna connect with a king there, but he was being sent to a widow there, the weakest, most vulnerable person on the socioeconomic ladder in this day and age. She was a marginalized person and on the fringes of society, but in this grand, beautiful, sweeping view of the grace and the goodness of God, Yahweh sends his prophet across state lines, across territory lines, out of the boundaries of what would represent the nation of Israel, the people of God. He sends him in unfamiliar territory to a person that most people would have completely disregarded. And can I just tell you that this is a beautiful arrow that points us all the way into the New Testament when Jesus in Luke chapter 4 would say, listen, I want to tell you who I am and the breadth of everything I've come to do by reminding you that in the time of Elijah, Jesus would say in Luke chapter 4, there were many widows that were in Israel in Elijah's day, but that's not where I sent Elijah. I sent Elijah to a widow that was in Zarephath specifically and strategically because in that moment we get to see the grand view of the redemption story beginning to take shape. And aren't you glad that the grace of God, the redemption of God, the goodness of God, the forgiveness of God, the mercy of God is not just for some people in a particular place but that it pushes past all barriers and past boundaries and it reaches people like us who have strikes against us, who have a history, who have a past, who may be marginalized or ostracized, the disenfranchised, the down and out, his grace and his goodness even reaches us. Elijah could have never known that by yielding to the unfamiliar, uncharted territory that Yahweh was sending him to, that he was actually helping to tell the entire redemption story. We don't realize that as long as we keep playing it safe, that we box ourselves out of an opportunity to be a part of God's kingdom purposes that span generations and span demographics. How grateful I am for Elijah's example. The widow of Zarephath and his time there reminds us that God can go anywhere. He can do anything for his glory and he can use me and he can use you to do it. So this week, we're going to spend a whole lot of time with Elijah in Zarephath. We're going to watch him being willing to forge this path in a new place with a new purpose and how it's going to help to shape his character in remarkable and in necessary ways because humility needs to be honed in him and in us. Pride needs to be removed in him and in us. Compassion for other people needs to be cultivated in us before we can stand on Mount Carmel as God's representative. And since this week, you and I are gonna be spending so much time looking at this entire scenario from Elijah's perspective, 
I thought that just for a few moments today that you and I could step out of his shoes and we could step into the widow's shoes. That we could learn from her example. That we could ask God to give us a little bit of insight from her life as to how we can handle scenarios we might be in that we find are similar to hers. Because the reality is she teaches us how to deal with deficiency. And if I know anything about you, and girl, let me tell you, I think I do, because our lives are pretty similar. We are navigating the regular, li the regular rhythm of everyday life. We have errands to run, we have children to raise, we have marriages to cultivate, or as single women, we have friendships that we are navigating, we have adventures of faith that God has called us on. We're weighing career issues and ministry issues and issues of balance and alignment. Listen, I understand, my life is just like yours. I spend most every Every day trying to figure out a new way to cook chicken for dinner just like you do my life is just like yours like you know all the laundry it's washed and it's dried but it's dumped out on the dining room table waiting for somebody somebody to come and fold it I don't know what I'm waiting on nobody ever does but our lives are very similar so I know that in some area of your life just like in some area of mine you are probably dealing with some area of deficiency this widow knows how you feel. You know, when you're emotionally spent, you have literally given everything you can to this marriage. You have poured yourself out, investing the emotional reserves and now you feel like you only have just a little bit of oil left. Or maybe you feel like you have given everything you have financially to that business that you've been building or that ministry that you've been trying to start and cultivate and you've given your last dollar to that investment and you really feel like you're on the last leg. You don't have anything left to give. Or maybe it's the creativity and the ideas that you've invested in that project. You have stayed up at night rehearsing the details and trying to come up with innovative solutions to try to bring to the table as you and other people maybe work together on that endeavor. And you've given it everything you've got and it has worn you out. You feel dry of creativity. Or maybe it's patience. You just ain't got no patience left. For that one, you know, that one coworker, that one that if she says one more thing to you, you're going to knock her out, that one. You feel like you don't have any patience left. You feel deficient. I think there's a little bit that we can learn from this widow because she strikes me as being similar to us. The main thing that makes me think that she's probably similar to us in some ways is that, you remember earlier when we were reading through that passage, the defining thing about this woman is that she was asked by Elijah to go get water and she was going to get it. That's what it says to us in verse 11, that she was going to actually get something that in that moment, given the drought, was going to be incredibly hard to find. This woman clearly had a willing heart that even though she was discouraged, even though she was despondent as a single mother trying to care for her kid, even though she sees no way to get out of the difficulty that she's having, she has no practical way to change it. Her outlook is clear. She's been very clear. I'm going to make one more little meal for me and my son, and then I think I know what's going to happen, Elijah. We're both going to die. We're going to perish. But in that moment, despite her own needs, she is not self-absorbed. She's not self-minded. She's not selfish to the point that she's become disinterested in serving somebody else. She literally is described in verse 11, despite her own lack and need, being willing to go get something for somebody else. You know what this tells me about her? It tells me she's not lazy. She's a hardworking individual. It tells me that she's also resourceful because remember, she's going to have to actually look for the water that she can, that she needs for her own family and also for Elijah. So we know she's hardworking, she knows, we know she's resourceful, and we also know she's got a tender, compassionate heart. She's actually willing to go do this. This tells me a lot about her, and I know that you have either met somebody like this or you yourself are this way. In fact, I think to some extent you are this way because here you are 
in this third week of Bible study with me. That means that despite your own deficiencies and despite your own needs and mine, despite the angst that you may be feeling about that issue you're facing in your own marriage or with your children or on your job or in that friendship that's got that breach in it, you're feeling this own lack that you have in your own life, the things that make tears well up in your eye because you cannot figure out a solution. What I do know about you being here in this third week of study is that you must be a person who is relatively hardworking, committed, diligent, resourceful, to keep you tuned in this long, that means you have some of the same framework as this widow has. To still be moving forward, going to help others, to serve others, to consider others despite their own need. And while she's doing all that hard work, just like you're willing to do all this hard work, just like you're willing to be committed in the midst of all you got going on in your life, in the midst of all of that, the trouble comes when in verse 11, Elijah says, well, while you're going to get it, please bring me a piece of bread. Has anybody ever asked you to do anything that sort of pushes you over the edge? You know what I mean. You were okay with helping them out with a little water, but it's this bread request that you just aren't going to be able to handle. It's just when you've been pushed over the edge and asked to do something, asked to give something, asked to find something, asked to contribute something, asked to produce something, asked to generate something, and honestly, you were with it up until now because now this request has pushed you to a place where you literally feel like you do not have what is going to be necessary for you to help that person and still continue to take care of yourself. This woman has just gotten pushed beyond the edge. She is dealing with a deficiency that likely she has never faced before, at least not as a result of drought in this scenario. She's pushed over the edge. And in this moment, she teaches us how to deal with deficiency when we are pushed over the edge. And when life is demanding of us, or sometimes, as is the case here, God seems to be asking something of us that we feel like we literally do not have the capacity to give. Now, before I give you these four little uh, simple steps that I want to leave you with today that we learned, that I've learned personally from the widow, I want to tell you that um, I'm in my mid-40s now, and I've been reminiscing just a little bit with friends through this process about how when we first started, uh, when I first started doing Bible studies just like this, it was, gosh, almost two decades ago now. And my second son was literally in my arms um, during a little Bible study called He Speaks to Me. He was three months old, my second son. Now he's this huge giant. He is six foot three inches, two or three inches tall. He just eats all day, every day. Big old dudes. I have three sons. They're all walking around my house, big old dudes. And I feel differently now in my mid-40s with grown children than I did when I was in my late 20s with babies. I feel different. Both of them carried their demands, but you know what happens. The older and older we get, well, our energy level changes our hormones change, our bodies literally change, we're fatigued faster, sometimes our level of patience isn't the same as it used to be, our focus isn't the same as it used to be. I can feel some of that happening, the older and older that I get. And so sometimes a request that, would, that comes to me in this season to participate in personal things, family things, ministry related things, sometimes those hit me differently now than they did in a previous season. And the reality is that's what will happen to you in each stage of life. I don't know whether you're a teenager or in your 20s or 30s or 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s or beyond participating in this Bible study with me, but only you know what that threshold is. We're in this season. If somebody asks for, for bread, if somebody asks for that particular request, it's the one that pushes you over the edge because in this season, you can only handle this much. The widow, no matter what season she meets you in today, is going to tell you how to deal with deficiency. The first thing I noticed about her in verse 12 is that she says clearly, plainly, and honestly, I, only, I, I don't have any bread. I only have a handful of flour in a bowl and a little oil in a jar. I love this about her. She is honest. She doesn't sugarcoat her reality. She is authentic about her limitations. 
she comes to Elijah and she says to him, remember, Elijah is representative of the very person and presence of God. It's like us talking clearly and personally and genuinely and authentically to God. She comes to him and she gives him authentic inventory. She doesn't sugarcoat it. She is genuine about her limitations and her inabilities. She doesn't try to make things look bigger or flashier or better than they are. She is honest about her lack and she dismantles any veneer of perceived perfection. She is forthcoming about what she has available. She brings it out in the open for Elijah, who represents the presence of God. She brings it out in the open for him to deal with and to realize. This is no time for a cover-up. This is no time for self-preservation. This is for the time for authenticity. And I'm discovering in my walk with the Lord that sometimes authenticity is the hinge upon which a miracle rests. That he's just waiting for me to be honest because the reality is he knows anyway, even if I'm not going to verbalize it, even if I'm not going to really share the actual real deal and be vulnerable, he knows anyway. The widow teaches us, take authentic inventory, just go ahead and be real and honest with God. Moses, when dealing with the millions of Israelites, he said, plain and simple, I'm unable to bear this burden alone. Peter, in Acts chapter 3, when he comes across a lame man that is looking to him for healing, he says, silver and gold have I none. He was honest, but that which I do have, I'm willing to give you. The feeding of the 5,000 in the Gospels, Jesus looked at the disciples and said, what do you have? Before I can feed this multitude of 5,000 men, not including women, of chil women and children, scholars say there were probably about 15,000 people in that group. And before they could be fed, he said to the disciples, I want you to be honest first about what it is you do have available and I'll work with what you have. They said, I have five loaves and two fish. And then on the backside of their admission and authenticity, miracle happened. Miracle after miracle after miracle. Are you honest with God? about your deficiency? Have you been honest with him about your limitations? Are you open and honest with him about what you feel you don't have enough of? The patience that may be enough for water, but it's not enough for bread. The self-discipline that feels like it might be enough for water, but not enough for this bread. The money that is, or the time, or the skill, or the talent that could have been enough for water, but now you've been asked for bread, and you feel like that's pushed you beyond the limits. The bread that is being required of you in this marriage or this ministry is beyond what you feel the, you have the capacity to extend. When we humble ourselves and are vulnerable with God, there's something about God that appreciates the humility with which we come to him and he responds to that authenticity and that humility. Take authentic inventory. But I will tell you that if there is a little bit of a problem with too much self-reflection or authentic inventory taking is that it can be a bit depressing. Because you know, if you spend too much time focused internally, you're bound to suffer from a bout of, I know I am, insecurity or intimidation when I keep uh, you know, in, in the front of my mind, what it is that I don't actually have access to anymore, especially when I'm comparing my now self with maybe a previous version of myself where I feel like I maybe had a little bit more energy or my body maybe felt a little bit stronger and more sure, or there was just more at my disposal in some particular area of my life. And so if we aren't careful, too much time on self-reflection and looking intrinsically can actually be to our detriment. And maybe that is why Elijah needed to give the widow a spur in the right direction for the next steps. Because then he says to her in verse 13, do not fear. That's the next step that I want to tell you. When you're dealing with deficiency, yes, take authentic in inventory, but do not fear. The miracle that God intends to do to you, for you, and then through you to somebody else, your son, in this case, uh, the widow's son was counting on her. It's going to require steps of faith that fear will paralyze you from taking without a doubt. 
Getting too wrapped up in your own inventory will drive you to a place of paralysis where you will assume that nothing can be done with the little bit that you have. So you won't take the steps of faith that God is going to require of you to partner with him in the miracle because you'll be so paralyzed by the fear that you feel. And so the enemy, listen, your very real enemy, you do know you have an enemy, right? You do know that just because he is invisible does not mean that he is fictional. He wants you to think that because you can't see him, he is just a myth. He wants you to chalk him up to someone in a red jumpsuit with a pitchfork that no better than for a caricature in a kid's storybook. But no, you have a very real enemy. And your real enemy, more than anything, uses the scheme of fear to target God's people. Not because he can destroy you with it or annihilate you with it. He cannot. Once you are a daughter adopted into the family of God, that means you have a permanent place of right standing with God that he can't do anything about. He's mad about it too, that he can't do anything about that. But he will use fear to disable you so that you are so paralyzed with fear that you never actually do the thing that is required so that you can reap the benefits of seeing God's handiwork in your life. And that's why over 300 times in the scripture, we are told, do not fear. Do not fear. Fear not over and over again in different ways phrased in different nuances we find this command do not be afraid it doesn't mean you won't feel fear of course you will you're human and so am i we'll feel it but it means you choose not to sit in it not to wallow in it it means you choose to go to war against the fear that you feel that as soon as that fear starts creeping up you literally find the promises of god that apply specifically to the de deficiency that is making you feel that angst and you write those scriptures down you post them where maybe you're going to see them all day long at, over the bathroom sink where you're washing little hands or over the kitchen sink where you're washing dinner or on the dashboard of your car where as you're driving running all those errands you can see the promise of God that can, begins to work that fear out of you so that you can push back the spirit of darkness he has not given you a spirit of fear but of power of love and of a sound mind Elijah says don't fear and then he says go two little letters that make a power-packed statement go now you can do all the research you want you can look it up in the original language you can go trace it throughout the scriptures you can do whatever you would like to do to try to get a deeper more um, rich meaning out of this word go but i want you to know that even with all that research you're going to come to the same conclusion go means go it means don't stay I want you to see that a very real part of this miracle taking shape in the life of this widow's family and as a result uh, in the life of Elijah as well was not just that she took authentic inventory, not just that, that she was honest with Elijah and not just that she chose not to wallow in her emotion. It was also going to require that she actually put one foot in front of the other and do something. She is being pushed, literally, Elijah represents the presence of God. She is being pushed out of the presence of God to put feet on the instructions that she's been given. The time for talking has been critical. It's been vital and it's been essential. But that time has now come to an end. Now, he says, is the time that you're actually going to have to act. Don't stay here. Go. I'm amazed at how we as Christians have a tendency to stay in the presence of God, to enjoy the presence of God as we should, to be in Bible studies like this one, I'm so glad you are. To be planted in church, I hope that you are planted in a Bible teaching church. A study like this one is a great supplement to that, but it is not designed to take the place of you being planted in the house of God and flourishing around the people of God. But I'm amazed how often we can be around the people of God, in the presence of God. We can cultivate our prayer life or even our time in God's word. But then when the Holy Spirit convicts us and challenges us and gives us clear direction of how we need to change our attitude or how we need to change our actions or the way that we need to respond proactively in regard to a specific situation. We've been so diligent in our time with God, but then we refuse to actually put feet to our faith. 
to actually do what it is that God has called us to do. Faith without works is dead. It's useless. So maybe you're at this stage of dealing with your deficiency. This part, you know, where your faith needs to get, get a job. It needs to go to work. Faith without works is useless. I remember because we have a um, gas stove at our house, so our house operates with electricity and gas, and we have a propane tank, tank outside the house we lived in for a decade when our kids were younger. And you know, you gotta get that thing refilled. And I remember that the tank had gone down one particular winter, there was snow on the ground, and we did not realize it until I went to go make some oatmeal for the family that morning, and I heard the click, click, click of the electricity, the igniter there, but there was no flame because I had the electricity, but because there was no gas in the propane tank, there was nothing to light it. It couldn't just be electricity, couldn't just be the gas. Both of them had to come together to ignite in something tangible. The same is true of our faith. You can click, click, click all you want, but if you don't actually have the action, the fuel and of, of obedience in doing what it is that God has called you to do, you will find out that the flame that you're looking for, the experience of God that you're after, it's not him, it's you, it's me. We're not being obedient and acting in faith to do what God has asked us to do. Take authentic inventory and then don't be afraid and then go. And finally, he says, Elijah says to the widow, do what you said you would. I love this so much. It's so simple. He said, here's the step that I'm asking you to take. Do what you already said you would. You know, it's interesting to me that sometimes when I want to know the will of God for my life, I'm praying in broad, big, grand strokes. I'm saying, Lord, would you please tell me your will? And what I really mean is for the next 20 years, Lord, I want to know 20 years from now what your will is for my life. It's this big grand prayer that we pray when we want to know God's will. Lord, show me the next 20 years. And most of the time, I think the Lord is thinking, you know what, if I could just get you to be obedient for the next 20 minutes, that would be awesome. What have I asked you to do today? This is my will. The next 24 hours that is stretched out in front of you, do completely and fully with an attitude as unto the Lord what he's asked you to do today. And so I ask you like Elijah did, will you just do what you said you would? You said you'd be committed to that organization for a year? Do what you said you would. You said that you would start each day with some time with the Lord. Do what you said you would. You said that you would take time to host those women at your home for a little coffee. You said that you would submit to the leadership of your church. You said that you would keep your calendar streamlined and not overly full. You said that you'd carve out margin despite the demands of ministry. You said you'd write that blog or that poem or that post. You said you'd find a mentor and be diligent about meeting with them. You said you'd take a meal to that elderly person. You said you would do it. I'm asking you, why haven't you done what you said you would? In the widow's case, she had told Elijah, I'm gonna gather up some sticks. Elijah said, good, do that. And gathering up those sticks would have seemed so, so meaningless, so useless, so small, so unimportant. But without those sticks, there could not be a fire. And without fire, there could not be bread that would be baked for her, for her son, and for Elijah. So when God provided the oil and there was flour there without sticks, there could be nowhere to make the meal that she needed. Those sticks weren't useless after all. So sis, what did you say you would do? Do it. Those sticks you're gathering are not useless. They're meaningful. They're the foundation for the fire that God fully in intends to set in your life in ministry. Gather those sticks, no matter how useless and ordinary and mundane the task before you may appear to be. Do what you said that you would. This week, as you pass through Zarephath, your father is going to encourage you through the widow that lives there. And he's going to refine you and he's going to refine me through the prophet who has now traveled there. And we're going to emerge more prepared than ever before and will need to be because Mount Carmel is coming. She is amazing. The, the deeper we go into this, the more I want to go. Can I grow up to be like her? <laughs> um, ladies, 
i can't add to what we just saw so i'm going to request that everybody stand like we did last time and we will start over on this side of the room and we will end up in the middle and I will start us and we'll go all the way around. Everybody will have their chance to request their special prayer today. Will you join me? And Tommy will finish when we're done. Father, thank you for this time to listen to Priscilla, to, to dig deeper and to examine our lives and our deficiencies. And be with us as we go forward this week doing our homework. Lord, I pray for my friends as they face death. And I ask that you would use me in any way. Let me not be so consumed with putting things in place in my next time that I forget to uh, be your servant human. Grant me, Lord, to those that need my help. Oh, Lord, so much is going on. Guide me. May strength fill anything you want me to do. Thank you for your guidance um, for my daughter in San Juan. I think you have a child. Please guide them to make sure that they get a good income to support each other. You know, and they're kind of stuck in a Father, I ask that you take away any fear that prevents me from doing your will, from working as a leader in the church. Thank you, God. Thank you. <clears throat> For your love and for your constant care for us in this toxic turvy world that we're in today. There's so many needs and help me be able to see the needs that I want to be able to do. And show me your will, Lord, that I might walk closer to you. I'm new to this group. And Lord, I could ask a million things right now for myself and my own deficiencies, but I want everyone in this room and everyone that's listening to this to not only think about themselves and their own issues and where God is leading them to press on, but I want you to adjust the story here and look at this for your church, for Bethel. Remember the sermons that have been given the last few weeks and how as a church, we are being asked to look at things authentically, to look at our deficiencies, to look at where we need to go, to what we need to press into, the changes we need to go through. We've been, from what I have learned, we've been in Cherif here at Bethel, and now we need to press on and press forward. So I'm asking each and every lady in this room to look around you and to be the 12 or the 14 or the 20 that need to come away from the situation and press into what the needs are here and help the people that are not here in this Bible study to press forward into what is needed here at this church because it is amazing. This is an amazing place to be given to So please help us press into your will here. Father, thank you for giving us this message that we need. And it's hard to leave your comfort zone and mm -hmm. do some of the things that you have given us. And we need the courage to do that. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> thank you so much for the times that you have rescued us and protected us. And there are so many, and you may not even recognize until much later, and sometimes we won't even know at all. But we know that you're there, and I, please help all of us to, to 
welcome the uncharted times and I mean, we know that you will help us to navigate those times and help us to reach out to you that we will know how to do this. Father, please help Rhonda, my niece, and all of those who are dealing with cancer. It's hard to really apply it. It's such a horrific disease. But help people feel your comfort in that difficult time. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for all the times that you have shielded us. I'm sure everyone in this room has been shielded from something. Perhaps they didn't even know about it. Thank you for your shield around me and my family, my children. Um, Heavenly Father, I just give you thanks for that. I ask you to give me the patience to recognize areas that I'm deficient in, that you are still working on me. Thank you. You didn't give up, but you're still working on me. Thank you. Heavenly Father, let every one of us leave here today and go back to our homes and begin to pick up the sticks we need to build the fires in our lives to go forth and do what you have planned for us to do. Help us remember that our faith is always bigger than our fears because you are with us every step of the way. Heavenly Father, you are several sovereign God. Through this Bible study, you are showing us that a mere nobody, like a Elijah, we can be just like Elijah when we accept that you are our life. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, ladies.